In 2003, there were 718 agricultural holdings. But in 2022, the Isle of Man census reported there are now only 343. Interestingly, since 2003, livestock numbers are up by 40,000. So why are we losing farms, yet animal numbers are rising? I'm Charlie Murray, and I was brought up on an arable farm in the north of the island. Growing up, I was very aware of the struggles farms were facing. But latterly, with their rapidly growing input costs, diminishing local markets, and rising costs that we're all aware of, things seem to have gone from bad to worse. They're, they're running at a loss. There isn't the research there to tell us what to do and how to do it. For some of us, I think it is, it is sustainable. In, in its current state, it does have its challenges, and those challenges will, will, will keep going. If you, if you start taking pieces out of the puzzle, then all of a sudden, it's gonna, challenges are, are just going to um, unfold that people just aren't, aren't envisaging. You're, you're now at crisis point. I've decided to explore the changes in the Manx agricultural industry and if it begs the question as to whether farming on the Isle of Man is sustainable. Over the past few weeks I've caught up with several local farmers to find out about the challenges they're facing and how we as the general public and the Isle of Man government can help so we don't lose our much valued local producers and local food security. Philip Christian and his partner Rose Crellin farm sheep and beef cattle over 4,500 acres, including the island's uplands. The last 12 months have seen their costs soar. Where to start, really? Input costs have gone through the roof. Export costs are also through the roof. Fertiliser's gone through the roof. It's come down a little bit lately, but it's still very expensive. But we're trying to work around that by growing other crops that fix their own nitrogen and stuff into the ground. Electric's gone through the roof and going up more, I believe. Water's quite expensive. Yeah. Or anything to do with feed and bedding yeah. has gone up. Everything's gone through the roof. And has that happened over the last 12 months or 24 months? Or over I the think it's been slowly months, really. happening, but in the last 12 months it's rocketed like everything has. Ian Parsons farms beef cattle and sheep. He is also the president of the Manx National Farmers Union. I think the biggest issues facing the whole of agriculture, along with many households as well, is the rise in energy costs we've had this last 12 months. Um, specifically in agriculture, the huge increase in the price of fertiliser as well as fuel. That makes cost of production significantly you know, higher, reduced margins, and I suppose also access to market. We're quite restricted on the Isle of Man that what isn't consumed locally, it's a very expensive bit of water to cross. And where do you see your business heading in the next few years? I'm, I'm generally ever the optimist, so I, I would like to hope we can push on. So, some of the um, input costs have reduced a bit, but I, I seriously think we need government to recognise agriculture a little bit more and the role it plays in the local economy. Um, I've. I think that certainly the present administration is very focused on um, e-gaming and finance as contributing to the economy, whereas agriculture can contribute a lot more and we get those better routes to market. I firmly believe there will be a bright future for agriculture. We last spoke in August at the Royal Manx Agricultural Show. At the time I brought up some of the challenges farms were facing and asked you what ideas the department had in place to help support the sector. Since then, what has the department done to support the industry? So I think it's fair to say it's been a really challenging time. We've, we've been putting together some uh, sort of discussions around support packages and things that we can pull, pull together. They've been uh, difficult to put together, I think it would be fair to say, with challenges around World Trade Organization rules, um, but also making sure that we are reflecting the challenges that exist across the whole of government. We are still working on a, a, a piece of work to provide additional financial support in the short term, but what we're wanting to make sure is that that financial support is designed to support 
change that hopefully will lead to longer term s sustainability for the whole sector. Sam Mori is a second generation arable farmer. His family made the choice several years ago to scale down on crop production and diversify into a livery yard and grown grass for silage and hay. The biggest issues facing our sector at the moment are rising costs, rising costs whether it be fertiliser or fuel or machines, whether it be labour or like I say new machinery is astronomical, it's just unviable at the moment. A lot of people have mentioned fertiliser costs. Can you just give us an example of how much they've gone up? Yeah, fertiliser was of circa £300 a tonne for nitrogen for quite a long time, 300 350 where last year hit record highs never seen before of nudging £1,000 a tonne. Um, that's just, it's completely unviable at that. Um, the only way you can really do it is to increase yields, but you're, you're sort of hampered by the weather, really. Like today, it's... It's hammering down where it's spring, it's meant to be dry, we're meant to be getting on with field work or helping the grass grow, but it's very, very tricky to do anything. Um, the fertiliser costs, lots of people budgeted the same amount but pulled the amount, the total back, so yields were affected somewhat and it's had a big knock-on effect to the merchants, I would say. And what are the needs for using fertilisers compared to not using them? Yield, basically, it's... Plant technology has not moved on as quickly as it should, really. Over the last 40 years, it's sort of, it's there, but we're not, the yields haven't increased like they did predominantly post-war era to the 70s, where now it's sort of stagnant. It's, you're getting good yields, but you've got to feed the ground. It's very, very hungry, arable and grass. If you're constantly taking away, it's very, very hungry. And where are those impacts felt most and where do you see your business heading in the next few years? The impacts are felt most when you sit down and you do the paperwork, you do a gross margin, you work out if you're actually making any money and you look at how much it's cost and you think people can't pay that. It's other producers, if I'm selling into the, if I'm selling into the beef or uh, sheep sector, it's very, very tricky. You, you know how much a bale of silage is and you think, I can't make that stack up. And you speak to them and say, well, this is what it's physically costing. It's physically costing this we're not making a, we're not making a lot at all making very little out of it the duggan family have run a dairy farm in the south of the island for many generations will now runs the farm with his wife robin everyone's probably sick of hearing farmers talk about fertilizer but you know the fertilizer costs even though they have come back slightly this spring a lot of what we purchased was back in december where the price was still high as you just didn't have any idea could could we get our hands on fertilizer when we need it so, you know, we, we bought, bought half early uh, and half in the spring and like the difference in that was, was still about £200 a tonne compared to uh, only about five years ago, it would have been about sort of £300 a tonne. Uh, not even that, sorry. And where, <coughs> do you think that's where the impacts have been felt the most? Yeah, I'd say so, but a combination of that, then you've got fuel, but just everything as far as like um, milk powder for, for feeding calves. Um, Anything that we're buying in, basically, the, the costs have just gone, gone astronomical. Although the Duggans grow an amount of their own feed grain, many dairy farmers still rely on the island's arable sector for feed and bedding. David Brew grows cereals along the north coast. You're, you're now at crisis point. Um, I've got no doubts about that. And, and I think to reverse that will take radical solutions, not minor solutions, not tinkering round the edges, as I think that that is probably all we're going to get from, from this government, because ultimately radical solutions would take resources. Probably government have greater priority on their resources, and there seems to be a, an unwillingness um, within governments here, successor governments and present governments, to 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 maybe sort of raise revenue, um, and I'm 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 talking there about sort of taxation. Basically, I mean we we live in a in a in a low taxation economy, so for government to actually raise revenue through taxation is almost impossible whereas other jurisdictions and England are, are one in in case have 
that's the way that they've they can they can narrow that black hole within the economy here it's 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 almost impossible for them to do it across the industry the price the farmers are getting for their produce has not been kept in line with their rising input costs as well as running his farm chris neal runs an agricultural consultancy business the percentage of the supermarket price that actually came back to the farmers and in lots of circumstances for for lots of foods it, it was less than 10 percent so it, when prices go up in the supermarkets, they're not, they're not coming back to farmers. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, a lot of supermarkets globally, certainly internationally, that would, that would blame farmers for the price of food going up. But actually, farmers aren't receiving that much more for their food than what they were a few years ago. Um, and we've had to absorb all those costs and challenges to our business over that time. There's no, there's no profit margin at the moment. It's very, very break even if you're lucky. Um, depending, it depends on the yield. Like I say, if you've got a good yield, it will help because you, you've got to work on a tonnage basis. But if you have a poor harvest where the yields are slightly down and the costs are high, you're making nothing. The difference from farm to shelf price varies a lot through different commodities, but it, it's quite frightening. We did a piece at the NFU prior to the um, Royal Manx Agricultural Show and we took a variety of products, and this was UK data, um, from bread to joints of meat to um, potatoes, vegetables, and on average, the farmer only received between 12 to 14% of what the consumer actually pays. So what the farmer receives as a percentage is very low. The local supermarkets are quite supportive, certainly to the dairy sector, um, a little bit less so when it comes to the red meat sector, but I, I firmly, personal view is that the supermarkets are to blame an awful lot for the state of agriculture throughout the UK. And does the department know the markup from what the farmer receives to what the consumer pays? So I've certainly seen the, uh, the tables that the MNFU have shared with me um, and it's, it's significant, it really is significant. And I know that um, I've heard stories from farmers as well where they've said it, you, know, you get to a point where you're like, you know, give me 10p for whatever it is because actually it's sickening to know that it's being sold for £1.50 when I'm getting so little for it. So I couldn't tell you the exact prices of different things but I know I've looked at those, those tables and also talked, as I say, at length with farmers about what those markups are and it really is quite shocking. I think on average it goes between 8 and 12 percent of what yeah. you're seeing on the shelf yeah. the farmers actually getting so is there anything that the department or the government in general can do to step in and support farmers in that area well so i think some of that's around us providing that supported by uh, selling power almost as it were um and that's something I, I do want to spend time looking at but it's going to take a, i think it's a longer and bigger piece of work Former car salesman Mike Walker and his partner Claire found a unique niche on the island in goat farming. Whilst their business has limited competition, they found their route to market solution. They aren't without their difficulties felt across the agricultural industry. The fact that a bag of um, the hard food that dairy goats need when they're lactating or, or growing kids inside them when we first started was probably £7.30 a bag. It is now £14.10 a bag. And the biggest problem is I can't charge twice what I was charging for the cheese because the public wouldn't buy it. It's just too much of an increase. So would the fees be where the impacts are felt the most? Yeah. Think? For, for me personally, because we're, although not certified organic, we are very nearly organic because we don't use any pellet fertiliser. We only use the uh, organic matter that comes out of the goats, which is recycled. Um, and I don't use any sprays um, and I don't use any, any poison for the vermin. That's why there's half a dozen Jack Russells kicking around somewhere. Have any of your products been able to keep in line with the increasing costs? If we're, if we're honest, if we are truthful and look into actually analyse all of the figures, inputs and what we can return, it's, no, it's a, down, it's a downward scale. 
Sean Dean from Bayview Manx Pork has been farming pigs for over 30 years. Last year, his business was in serious doubt as the numbers weren't adding up and they're still recovering from a surprise decision made over a decade ago regarding the number of pigs the meat plant would take in. I'm glass half full, always have been glass half full, and we took a, a big decision last year uh, as to whether to go out. It was when, when, you lo when each pig that's lo leaving the farm is losing in excess of £45 a head, you've got to make big decisions. And my daughter is on the farm with us. She's worked on the farm for 18 months now, uh, which makes the decision even harder because it's not just me. You know, we have, I have another lad who's worked with me for 13 years. But glass half full, I, I believe pigs going forward, and sadly it's because of a lot of my counterparts in the UK have gone bust, but I think pork is actually going to be worth what it should be for the first time in my lifetime. How did the surplus of pork affect your business last year? The, well, the surplus of pork, yeah, technically there wasn't a surplus of pork on the Alaman. Okay. Uh, we got, uh, Alaman pig industry was restructured in 2011, which we went from producing 90 pigs a week to the government telling us pretty much we couldn't produce any more than 30 pigs a week, which, as you can imagine, is a massive change. And again, it was another time where we decided whether we carried on going, but we did. Uh, we had to really restructure big. Uh, so technically there's, I'm sure the government did a, did a survey at one point, and I'm sure it's in excess of 200 pigs a week the Isle of Man eats in one form or another. And was there any consultation when the pig numbers dropped to what they were willing to take in? Very little. No, we were pretty much we were pretty much told it was happening. There was no uh, we did we did speak to them to try and get, you know, something out of the out of the government. And and the government do support pigs on it. Without government support on the Isle of Man there wouldn't be any pigs. I must I must put that in there. So government do actually help pig production. But I think in a way government could help us rather than putting money in I think, I don't know what you actually think, Charlie, but I think a law which allows Danish, Polish, Italian, wherever you want, pork to come into the Isle of Man, a sausage to be made out of it, and it be able to be called a Manx pork sausage, to me, when you can't get rid of pigs, really hits hard. Why is it that firms are allowed to sell, for example, Manx sausages, yet the main ingredients can be made of imported pork or different meats? but then be sold on the shelf as banks. So this is a huge frustration of mine, something that I've, I've requested officers to look at how we can address. I think it's disingenuous for a start. I think it's also you know, misleading to the consumer because they can think that they're supporting local produce when in fact we've got great quality local pork and we're using imported pork to make sausages. I mean, that's just one example. There are other things. Um, and I think there's, there's definitely a role for DEFA in, in resolving that issue. It's something we are aware of and something we are looking at. Dairy farmers on the island are in a fortunate position, with Isle of Man Creamery being a farmer's cooperative. This means that they are owned by the 30 farms that supply milk to them. However, they aren't without their struggles. The core family have diversified by producing eggs, but their core business remains supplying the island's creamery. Prices have, uh, so our milk price, for, uh, for example, has risen um, slightly in the summer, uh, the autumn as well. Uh, to keep in line. We're always kind of shadowing what the UK do, so the UK markets um, also went up with the, so it's all traded on a, on a world scale, world cheese market went through the roof, uh, really good global prices, uh, but then recently, I mean, it's just gone back down again and unfortunately the milk price echoes that. Um, half, almost half of what we produce on island now is sold locally. Um, to um, with retail milk, uh, cheese, butter, cream, um, and the rest is exported to um, uh, Emirates and Australia, or, um, America, Spain as well. We never hit the high um, price, which we never we never expect to. Uh, um, being on island, we're, we're always um, in the past. It's always never hit the peak. Uh, never hit the peaks. Never hit the troughs. Whereas. Unfortunately, last year we were we were lagging like 10p a litre behind. And why is it not keeping in line with UK prices? Well, what what we're always, you know, understanding of uh, of Isle Man Creamery is that it it 
its business model with the, the mature cheese, it runs better on a, on a falling or a static market. And unfortunately, when the market just went crazy and started to climb as much as it did and as fast as it did, it, it just couldn't, couldn't keep pace with that. Yeah, the local market is really what keeps our industry, our dairy industry, 30, maybe just under 30 dairy farmers now um, afloat. Um, without that, we would be looking at uh, very different prices, I'm sure, if we had to rely on export alone. So, um, yeah, thank you for keeping us going, really, and <laughs> buying Manx where you can. Other sectors aren't as fortunate and are now facing a lack of route to market. The arable sector is struggling with a local market after Laxey Glen Mills faces the backlash of losing Ramsey Bakery in April last year. Laxey Glen Mills sold 80% of their flour to Ramsey Bakery. Since the closure of the bakery, the demand isn't there, and the mill now claim they have enough wheat in their silos to last them for the next two years. Arable farmers now have no other choice but to export their milling wheat and other cereals, except for feed grains that they can sell to local farmers, but even with that, they're left with a surplus. The difficulty then comes in with the cost of exporting. It's very, very difficult at the moment with, with what's not consumed locally in, you know, from, there's obviously a lot used on Ireland, I, I purchased a significant amount for finishing cattle, um, but outside of what's used for animal feed, obviously we've lost the route to market with the um, mill, though the mill is still there. It's obviously with the loss of Ramsey Bakery, it's virtually using zero wheat that uh, was contracted to grow. So unless there is new markets found or access to very good markets on the other side of the, uh, the water that the needs a little bit of help to access. It's very, very worrying going forward. With the situation with Laxey Glen Mills, very, very little was taken in. Um, they have a supply for two years, apparently, so we it was sort of left high and dry, really. So is that the situation with Laxey Glen? They don't need any more? They, at the moment, the, the silos are still full. They have a supply for two years, as they say, and we sort of we were left with an opportunity where it was either export it or semi sit on it. The price offered by the mill was not enough to break even. Um, even then, the intake they had no idea when they'd take it in, so it'd be still sat on farms till now. Whereas it is still sat on farms in some cases. And what happens if the grain is just sat on the floor in the shed? Um, cash flow is the biggest thing let alone the, the grain physically sat in store it could creep up in moisture slightly so you could have to redry it again it's very very rare in modern grain stores but um, it's more the financial aspect if you've got no cash flow because it's still sat in the shed how do you pay your bills it's very very tricky when you've got fertilizer bills spray bills fuel bills machinery finance or even replacement and you've still got your product sat in the shed and of course now you're in absolute crisis because Ramsey Bakery closed, 80% uh, of the market for Laxey Glen Mills disappeared overnight um, and now there, there has to be a, a major question mark of whether Laxey Glen Mills can, can stay open. Personally, I don't think it can. Our current route to market, um, like I say, the current route to market for the animal sector with how tight things are at the meat plant whether it be staff shortages or staggers or physically just not able to get the stock through at a timely manner um, the only option is to export and our route to market is the boat now the Isle of Man government's theory on food security is the bought another boat in my opinion um, that's maybe not the stance of the whole industry but that's my stance as a producer the only way we can grow agriculture now is an export and road haulage equivalency. We need to be helped. We need to put trailers where if it's costing thousands of pounds to put trailers out on the boat. Well, that's just coming straight off our margin. The only ones making any money out of that at the end of the day are government as owners of the steam packet. Road haulage equivalency would not only make a potentially business saving opportunity for arable farmers, but also meat farmers who are struggling to get their animals into Isle of Man meats, also referred to as the meat plant and fat stock. Currently exporting about 80% um, due to problems with the meat plant and not being able to take stuff in on time. Uh, also I've changed my policy a bit to 
breeding more store stock, which is more suited to us. And then also sell breeding stock to other farmers away because f coming from the Isle of Man, we have quite a good health status and our stock is quite sought after. And what are the complications of exporting them? The price of the boat mainly, yeah, it's quite expensive. And what would you like to see the government do to help? Help with the cost of exporting, like a road haulage equivalency. Um, the Scottish Islands have, um, it was put in place many years ago where to try and keep the sort of rural economies trading out there, that they implemented road haulage equivalency, which is the distance travelled across the water is calculated as what it would be on a road, on a motorway. So therefore, I think when we last calculated it out, it would be about a quarter of the cost to cross from Douglas to Lancaster if we had a similar sort of arrangement in place. Okay. So it would give, you know, give massive opportunities to routes to market for all kinds of products. And you know, that's something for food businesses in, in general, like for the processors, for, you know, I, I personally think the Isle of Man government should do it for all manufacturing on the Isle of Man. To get to the UK on, a, on road would probably cost about 200 to 300 pound. Currently the boat's nearly 5,000 pound for one load of stock. And would your sector benefit from road haulage equivalency if you were to export? If I make the decision to go much bigger, uh, yes, because um, well, it's with, with the red meat sector, a lot of a lot of the deductions that the, the farmers have to take on board is getting the uh, getting the carcasses away to the UK meat markets. So, so yes, road equivalency would help definitely. It would definitely help. It would help every sector. No two ways about it. Because um, even what we're selling, mature cheese everything that goes off island would, would make a big difference. Um, we could have been exporting liquid milk last, last summer. Um, I believe the costs were somewhere around 11p a litre to, to export, which when we were 10p behind, well, it, it just didn't make sense to do it. Where, you know, we, we, could have, we could have kept pace a lot better with the UK prices if, um, if everything, you know, if we didn't have the, the equivalency. And with the government owning the craft as well, that, that's the bit that it just seems to make no sense when they can actually do something positive um, more for the economy, not just for farming. It, it, would, it would help any industry if, if uh, exporting goods off the island was, was a road haulage equivalent. And why will the Manx government not yet create a road haulage equivalency scheme when it has proven to be a vital lifeline for farmers in Scotland? So that's absolutely, as I say, a piece of work we're doing with DfE at the minute. Um, I wish it had been done sooner, but it hasn't done, and that's something that we're working on. But I think there's an absolute commitment, both from Tim Johnston as the Minister of DfE um, and myself, to find a way to, to bring something that works for the Isle of Man farmers to make sure they can access those markets. But as I say, it's not simple, and there are elements where we have to go through funding uh, requests, but there is a commitment absolutely with DfE to resolve the road haulage equivalency. So clearly you're very for road haulage equivalency and know that it will be a game changer. So will you be bringing it forward to proposals to Coman to see if the scheme can be progressed? So I say we're working with DfE absolutely with that end goal in mind. And how do you see the current state of the meat plant? Oh, that's a very tricky question, isn't it? <laughs> um, from a producer's point of view, we've definitely seen improvements since January. We've um, we're, you know, processed the stock through there quite regularly at the moment and there's definitely been an improvement since January but it's a very tricky one um, it's it's an essential part of the agricultural supply on the island and it's always going to need support from government but there needs to be massive improvement but hopefully we are on the road to some improvement uh, majority of all the cattle go through apart from cool stock we um, lambs probably around about Half to two thirds go through the meat plant, but we do sell others as store just purely because the costs of finishing on the Isle of Man are significantly higher than that in England. I think that what we would all like to do is support the abattoir and um, produce food and produce it for local people. But the grim reality is that you're running a business when you're farming. 
and it, when stock's ready to go, you have to be able to, for it to go. Going by the Bernie report, it's kind of uh, unsustainable, really. Um, but that's not saying that we don't want it. You know, we'd be, we'd be lost without a, a facility on island, really. And the outcome of the Bernie report made it quite clear that the meat plant is operating at a below average standard. Why is this and what are you going to do to turn it around? So there's already been significant work that's happened at the meat plant. Um, certainly in the short term, that's been around making sure that all of the health and safety elements are, are addressed. Some of those, it's fair to say that uh, although they didn't comply in terms of the report, actually the, the relevant uh, actions had been taken, they just weren't able to be presented in the right form, so they were relatively easy to address. We've also recently engaged um, the services of health and safety advisor to come over and fulfil some of those other elements that needed to be done. That's been our immediate priority, I think it's fair to say, in the meat plant, and also stabilising some of the staffing issues. It's not a solved problem, I'm not going to pretend it is. Um, and obviously it was very clear in there that it was a sales-led recovery. It's clear to see the road haulage equivalency would be a vital lifeline to all sectors. But it highlights just how much of a domino effect losing one sector would be on the others. If, there's, if, if the arable sector falls, then for other dairy farms, then it, it, it just it, it changes the pyramid of things. And at the minute, everything is so... You we were saying earlier, everything's like dominoes, and, and if you take one piece out of the puzzle, then all of a sudden everything starts to starts to collapse because the the not having the arable sector will be a massive um, hit for the beef industry, which that that benefits us, and then once again it'll it'll knock onto the dairy. It, it's um, you know everything needs to function. Uh, really, is the is the big thing. All the sectors have to work together. The beef and sheep and the dairy and the arable all have to work together. Now, whether it be me selling silage to the, to the animal sectors or whether selling straw or exporting grain, whatever it may be, or even on a contracting basis, they have to work together. I think government need to realise the implications that has on other sectors. It's not just the cereal sectors. The livestock sector relies on straw from the wheat production and it's, it's a very much, agriculture in the Isle of Man is very much joined up and integral to each other. See, we buy a lot of, uh, all the grain we buy, uh, we, yeah, say 600 ton. It's it's quite a big uh, it's quite a big a lot in the whole scheme of things of what uh, purchase and off arable farmers. Uh, I sp I suppose you know, ideally I could do with the ground to put my own muck on to grow some of my own grain. I don't have the ground, so uh, it doesn't work in that way. But I think you know, I'm the treasurer of the farmers union as well. I think farmers have all got to stick together everything complements everything in my view and you know we've got yeah we've all got to be on the same page and what would the impact be to you if there ended up being really no arable sector over here uh, there'd be no pigs it's quite yeah this is quite simple if i if i had if i had to import uh, unless prices went through the roof if i had to import all feed from the uk i wouldn't be doing pigs and for currently without any road haulage equivalency, what support is the department giving those arable farmers that have got crops in the ground mm -hmm. and now really, obviously there isn't enough animals over here to sell all of those crops to for feed grain, what are they now meant to do? So we have talked um, with them and I know the mill have talked with them specifically about the milling wheat. Um, and in terms of the actual support, that's one of the reasons why we're looking to get additional financial support in the short term. Um, but that is a challenge and it's not something where I don't have unfortunately money sitting around extra and I, that that is a position I think that every department's in and we've seen the pressure that departments are under so it really is a case of trying to manage the money that we have and make sure it's going to the areas that are most important so it's not a case that I have you know reserves of money that I can just allocate in the short term which is why we have to look at putting a, a, a solution in that is going to provide long-term routes for market for those individuals to make sure that they can continue to provide those uh, those services that are so fundamental across agriculture. 39% of Manx farmers are now having to diversify and think outside the box of their routine food production. How have you ended up going to chickens? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so we are obviously um, a dairy farmers to start off with uh, and and a little bit of beef as well. Um, I went away to college and did some traveling uh, and I came back home and I wanted to um, become part of the business. So um, we bought some extra cows 
and then ironically yeah it's just one thing led to another that some um hen houses became available and um we just thought that it would be the, the demand for local food was there and we just really wanted to try something different we'd been um dairy farmers and um for a while and we just thought we'd like to branch out so if we want to grow the business um we may have to look into other retailers to help us uh, a bigger farm shop we've got a little farm shop here we could uh, expand that or i could um, downsize and just do the specialist cheeses not necessarily the liquid milk or the fiber um, i may have to diversify into possibly a, a bit of a campsite because there's going to be a shortage of campsites very soon with two big campsites i believe coming to an end over, over the next year or so. And why are we seeing an increase in farmers diversifying? Uh, because they they need it to make ends meet. You know, an awful lot of Manx business, farming businesses, as with a lot of businesses in the UK, they're, they're running at a loss. So they're looking at other means to try and bring in an income to the business. Does this leave room for Manx agriculture to think of new ways to make a viable product that could also benefit not only their cash flow, but also the Alaman government's net zero pledge. There's massive opportunity to diversify on the net zero targets. Um, we need help with government allowing us to either build things or government providing. The private sector has more than adequate resources to build something, whether we be using the seaweed that washes up, the food waste from the prisons and the schools, the green waste that goes to the community sites, the sludge cake comes from Miri Veg or the water treatment works, even government facilities alone, or like say likes of the seaweed, you've got a massive resource there that could be used to provide electricity for homes um, instead of just burning fossil fuels constantly in gas turbine power stations. Um, some farmers have told us that a huge area for growth would be an AD plant. Is your department able to get behind farmers who wish to take advantage of more profitable opportunities in this area? Yeah, it's interesting. I chatted to uh, someone at the um, Milling Wheat Growers uh, uh, stakeholder engagement session about that very topic um, and I've agreed to go and have a coffee and, and sit down and talk about that further because I think all of these options are absolutely things that we should be discussing and we should be making opportunities available to farmers to allow them to look at other opportunities to make the business sustainable in the longer term and if that is diversification in some elements that's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, we certainly shouldn't be putting blocks in the road. I think the, uh, the Alaman government has been, some people would say slow, some people would, be, would say asleep, um, because the, I'm involved with the, the NFU, and the NFU has been talking to the Alaman government for years about a bit of help to put windmills up, to put panels up. I've got, I've got panels on this roof, and I just don't see why but obviously they've had a, a very big power station to pay for, so they've not really embraced it. I think it's probably the biggest industry that could help with net zero, to be fair, when you uh, probably pig side of it, you know, where we've gone down the route for renewables, you know, I think government could help us to help ourselves as well. You know, just talking about the uh, costs for electricity that are coming up, you know, if they would help us to put solar up to actually generate some more of our own electricity you know it would be something we would look at to invest in as well green energy production on farms we're lagging way behind in the isle of man it, it's been going on for over 10 years across in the uk but i think that's just looking at it at one side um, to meet our net zero um, ambitions as the island agriculture is one of the few industries in fact it's the only land-based industry outside of forestry that we actually sequester carbon so yeah, we can benefit from the other side as well, and I don't think it's recognised the work that agriculture does in sequestering carbon as well. The government have schemes in place that are vital in the survival of our farming industry. However, when more land is used in order to abide to these schemes, it leaves less land to farm. And does that production support add up to cover the costs and provide the farmers a wage? I'm fundamentally against production support. It's got, but the profit has to come from the marketplace, but people cannot pay high food prices and the way everything's going food is going to end up doubling if you're not careful and with these agri-environment schemes the more land you take out of production whether it be food whether it be grazing ground whether it be 
crop ground or even food, even ground for fuel potential, if it's just rewilded or trees planted or ponds dug, when the shortage of food comes, which is not far away, it cannot be far away, people are going to struggle because food is going to double, at least double, and it's just knowing what to do. But people are struggling now. Well, if it doubles, people aren't going to be able to feed themselves. Do you see a role as a food producer or keeper of the countryside? Both. I firmly believe that, you know, as a farmer, we are food producers. But keeper of the countryside, you know, if we don't look after our land, it doesn't produce for us. It's our, it's our greatest asset. So, we, you know, we, we want to maintain the countryside, but there's a huge cost to that. And I think that isn't always recognised by government. They sell the Isle of Man off and tourism and stuff like that and how the place looks. And that's a direct result of productive farming. I am definitely a food producer more than a gardener on a large scale. Um, and there's a, and, and in, the, in regard to the countryside, enhancing the countryside, there is only so far you can go. You know, it's all right, it's all right looking after the Tweety Birds and the Bunny Rabbits. We can't be keeping the countryside looking as well as it does without farming it. Um, whilst we're stood here today, you know, believe it or not, the sun is shining and we're pumping carbon into the soil. We're actually sequestering carbon as we stand here today and that wouldn't happen without these animals stood here behind us. And um, that wouldn't happen without us farming this land. Um, and, and probably, you know, we are actually sequestering more, more carbon than uh, what would be here if, if we just left this ground to, to trees. There is clearly an uncertainty towards a local market food security chain, which seems a massive shame when we are lucky enough to be on an island that has an opportunity to be self-sufficient without purely relying on exports. In its current state, it's not looking hopeful for existing farmers, nor is it an easily accessible industry for keen younger people to get involved in due to the driving costs. So really, is farming on the Isle of Man sustainable in its current state? For some of us, I think it is it is sustainable, but I really think I don't want to be somebody producing the same as everybody else because um, it, that will, that's the reason I, I didn't start milking cows for myself. I didn't buy sheep and I didn't buy cattle because the good farmers on the Isle of Man have already got that wrapped up. I've, I've like to think I've wrapped up the, uh, the goat's cheese market. So the future is, if there's no help before long, the, there will be no sectors left, there'll be no arable sector, there'll be no, I'll be, won't be producing silage for the beef sector or the lamb sector or the dairy sector because they will be gone as well. Food security is not a nice new boat. Food security is not a new inter interconnector for electricity. Real food security is what we can actually eat grow quickly ourselves to feed the local population when the Ukraine war comes a bit closer, the railways stop in the UK, the lorries stop in the UK, so no foodstuffs are really delivered to your nice new boat to bring over here. So I think food security, I've found it really interesting actually um, since we started the food security strategy journey in DEFA. My understanding of food security has changed, but actually it became much more in the spotlight during COVID when suddenly the, some of those access routes to food just weren't there. And we did see people changing their food buying habits. And I think what's unfortunate is we haven't seen those changes become sustained and people have reverted back to their original buying habits and so those are challenges that we have to look at how we can address in the local context to make sure that the Isle of Man uh, producers are working on a level playing field against those imports. Um, one of the, the biggest factors from government I think that could be changed that affects agriculture and other businesses on the Isle of Man is procurement. Um, government's the biggest feeder of people every day on the Isle of Man and they use very little Manx produce. Some of that is down to the way procurement works where it's purely focused on buying the cheapest, which local produce isn't always the cheapest, but they're not taking in that multiplier effect it has on the economy. And also 
I think we, we, through government, they feed a lot of processed food and we probably should be back to using more local seasonal produce. You as the government talk about food security, but through your procurement policies, you actually buy very little Manx produce for government around buildings, including like the prisons, schools and hospitals. So what percentage of the food that's actually in those buildings is Manx? So <laughs> this is something I've asked and it's actually it's a challenging uh, question because the way they do the procurement, they buy through a Manx seller and therefore it meets the requirement of being bought from a Manx producer, although that producer is not the end producer, that is a, a middleman essentially. Um, the challenge therein is that we don't know what the breakdown is of Manx food that's used within that because it's not stipulated within those procurement contracts. So again, officers within DEFA um, and absolutely supported by me on this are working with the procurement teams to understand what we can do to stipulate where we should be using Manx produce within those existing contracts. Um, because I absolutely agree. I think it seems totally disingenuous to be importing food to use within government industries, not least because the the multiplier effect of spending in the local economy. So, you know, we hear the one pound, for every pound spent, you get one pound 82's worth of uh, value to the local economy. It's absolutely right, we should be buying local, but we need to make sure that the system works for that. So there is work going on, working with procurement to try and address that issue. And how is it setting an example for the Manx public if the government themselves aren't doing as they're telling everyone to do? No, and that's my point. I agree. I mean, I think we need to change it. So I've been quite outspoken on it and I will remain to be so. And do you see a sustainable future for Manx farming? That's a very difficult one to answer at the moment. Um, there'll need to be change for there to be a sustainable future. But we are, you know, we're in a world where we've got a growing population and less production of food. So food security is gonna become a lot more serious in years coming, going forward. And it needs to be taken a lot more seriously. And in which case, if that is recognized, there'll be a better future for Manx farming. I think if nothing changes, then the reality is we will simply see a decline. And I think that's why for me, it's imperative that there is changes. There is those uh, opportunities to access export markets. And there is those opportunities to ensure that the that the farmers are able to, to make a, a future, future proof business. Some of that's around making sure there's people to take over the farms as well um, and to re reduce those impacts of people potentially simply buying up land, as I said, speculatively, where it's not going to be used for farming in the future because that is certainly something that concerns me. Within the industry, the, the change, we, we need to encourage a lot more younger people to come into the industry. The age profile in the industry is quite worryingly old but there's no point in encouraging the younger in members of the industry to join it until there's a profitable, viable industry there. So I suppose the farmer's getting a fairer share of what the consumer pays. Um, food doesn't necessarily need to get more expensive, but the return on farm needs to be greater as the majority of products that are produced on farm are below the cost of production. So unless we can change that, there is no bright future for Manx agriculture.